Jesus, raise your hand. Uh, it's a great thing. Would you stand to your feet today? And as you stand to your feet, why don't we pray together and ask the Lord's blessing upon this time that we have in his house. I don't know about you, you caught it on the way in, but but it's it's Valentine's week and you can't go Valentine's without having chocolate. And so uh, we've got some chocolate cake for us to enjoy today. It's going to be a great day that we're going to hear from Brother John L. Martin, and uh, we're going to be inspired as we are each and every time that he brings God's word to us. So let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for the privilege that we had to call upon your wonderful name. Lord, you are amazing. You are awesome. You are magnificent. We bless your holy name today and every single day of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for inhabiting the praises of every people as we lift up your holy name. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. The book of Psalms says to us that we should enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and his courts with praise. And so let's sing about it as we start out this wonderful time together here at Living Proof. I will enter his gates. Let's clap up to the Lord. Here we go. I will enter Yeah. 
That's the song of our heart today, Lord. We love you. We love you and we thank you for all of the great things that you've done. We thank you, Lord, for first loving us while we were yet sinners that Jesus came and he died for us. Thank you, Lord, that your love extends beyond our love going back to you. Lord, thank you that you love us with an everlasting love, a, a love that will never fade, a love that will never go away. Thank you for your love. And I pray, Lord, today that for each one of us in this room, myself included, Lord, that our love for you would grow stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger each and every single day. Thank you, Lord, for you are wonderful. In Jesus' name we ask it. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. And all God's people said, amen, 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 amen. What a great thing it is. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It is good to give praise to the Lord. Amen to that? Amen. It is good to give praise to the Lord. Hey, would you do me a favor and give the worship team and give Josh on piano a hand today? Thank you so much. That's not going to happen, but, uh, uh, but, but that's a very nice comment in that direction. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Well, uh, we'll talk about a few things here in a second, but um, chocolate cake stands between you, me, and that opportunity. So uh, I'm keeping this short. I mean, what a piece of cake. There you go. That's good. That is good. That's good. Well, uh, as we take a break here and enjoy some fellowship, and uh, they're on carts, they're, they're wheeling your way. In fact, wow, just a service with a smile. In fact, that is a great thing. Uh, always feel free to grab some coffee. Uh, I believe uh, coffee, there's some, uh, some decaf as well, some water if you'd like that. And uh, let's, uh, let's take a break. Let's enjoy some fellowship. I'll share some things while we're doing that as well. So God bless you. Thanks so much. And thanks to... Alan and Linda, the wonderful team that we have that's put all this together for us today. Okay. So if I may, let me share a couple of announcements. That was on me. I turned it off. Uh, let me share a couple of announcements with you, some things that are happening within uh, our Living Proof family. I uh, want to share with you that on March 16th, everybody say March 16th. March 16th. March 16th will actually be my last, my last Wednesday with you. And so that's why I... I uh, I knew that was coming, and, and so I thought, hey, let's have some fun. And so we're going to cater in Olive Garden that day. Uh, we have tickets available for a spring fling banquet that will be here. And so we're going to have pastas, we're going to have meatballs and sausage and fettuccine and Alfredo and marinara sauce and, and breadsticks and salad and all sorts of good stuff. So. So you need a ticket. You need a ticket. So here's here's the rule on the tickets. Once again, everybody listen up. Tickets are $10. If you can't afford the $10, just say, can I have a ticket? And they will hand you a ticket. It's as simple as that. We want you to be here. I want you to be here. And uh, I would love to uh, 
uh, just to celebrate with you. Now that's at 4 p.m. Everybody say 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's tough to say 4 p.m. in the midst of having chocolate cake, but uh, <laughs> it kind of comes across a little muddled, but uh, that's okay. So 4 p.m. that day. So we will not, on March 16th, I know there's plenty of time before that happens, but on March 16th, instead of having our regular time at 2.30 and our regular time at 7 p.m., we're going to have one time, both combined together at 4 p.m., okay? So that'll be taking place. Yes, Ruby. Everybody get a piece of cake. If you didn't, uh, or you, you want a second piece, then put the first piece under on your lap and just say, I didn't get a piece of cake, and, and we'll deliver a second piece to you. <laughs> I, I hope the chocolate is rich enough for you. Uh, Costco uh, chocolate cake uh, tends to be uh, fairly rich, fairly rich. Yeah, I like that, you know. You know, and I will tell you something. So, I, you know, in the midst of all the things that are happening, uh, I'll, I'll bring everybody up to speed on several different things here this this afternoon. But uh, as as Pastor Josh Gerbrock, how many of you know? How many of you know personally? You know Pastor Josh Gerbrock. Raise your hand if you know who he is. That's great. That's awesome. Others of you, you'll get to know him. But Pastor Josh loves chocolate, like even more than my wife loves chocolate. <laughs> And that's like saying something. Like, my wife will skip dinner and go straight to the chocolate. You know? So, I, you know. Anyway, I knew, I knew Pastor Josh was off the chart in his chocolate loving when one day we were at the Cheesecake Factory together, and he got the Godiva chocolate cheesecake, and he ordered a side of fudge to pour on top of it. <laughs> I looked in amazement. I'm like, dude, are you actually doing that? He goes, oh, this is so good. <laughs> I'm like, okay, the guy likes chocolate. So uh, he will make me seem like I'm short. I'm 6'2", he's 6'5". And so, uh, you know, many of you, as you've been a part of the church, some of you, you know, for a number of years now, know that uh, they joined us uh, on the team 14 years ago as executive pastors and uh, then uh, moved uh, to Apple Valley to pastor, uh, you know, the church there in terms of ministry eight years ago and, and been doing that. And he's been overseeing the finances, been doing a great job for us ever since. And so he is stepping in as the interim person. If you did not hear my, uh, my announcement on Sunday uh, that uh, I submitted my resignation as the pastor of the church, and so I, I just do feel like I need to say that because there could be a few of you that actually did not hear that news. And new, news spreads uh, fast, uh, but it may, for whatever reason, not hit you. Uh, I've accepted the opportunity to join Pastor Rich Guerra at the district office as an assistant superintendent of the SoCal Network of the Sons of God in the area of leadership development and church ministries. And uh, uh, boy, it was, it was, uh, this weekend was not easy to say that to you, because I love all of you. I love all of you. And um, you've made some very, very kind comments back. Um, some of you want to throw rotten tomatoes at me, and I get that. And so uh, I, I understand. It's been an amazing 15 years, 15 plus years. I wouldn't believe it's been 15 years. And God's done some, some awesome things that would be, put me as the third longest tenured pastor in the church. Uh, Vernon Neibach, and I believe was here 17 years, and uh, Tommy Anderson was here over 20. Yeah, to, does anybody, I'll, I'll look to Ruby in the back. Do you remember um, Tommy Anderson, Tommy and Billy were here how many years, do you remember? Was it 20, 25, was it, was it that long? I, I can't remember. I just know it was a, uh, a wonderful uh, run. And, and so that puts me as the, the third longest tenured pastor of our church. And so once again, it's been a joy and privilege and honor uh, to serve in, in this capacity. I do hope that you're able to come out um, each and every Sunday for that matter. But we're going to do a fun uh, kind of blowout combined service on Sunday the 27th of March, our last Sunday with you. And we're actually not going to do a Saturday night service. We're going to put everything together on that Sunday morning service. And uh, we're going to be inviting our Hispanic ministry to join us as well. And we're just going to have a great time filling the sanctuary 
Uh, if you have other people that you know of that have had a connection with our church, uh, it would be great to, to see them come out for that service. And so uh, I just share that with you for what it's worth. You may know some friends on other campuses, and they may want to come here that day. I've already alerted our campus pastors, hey, there could be a few people that, that want to come here that just for that Sunday. And so uh, I understand that. Pastor Josh Kerbrock will start as the interim pastor the very next day on the 28th. And uh, please, please be in prayer for, uh, for all of what takes place as the board is seeking who that next pastor will be. And uh, I'm believing for great things to take place uh, as it did, uh, well, 15 and a half years ago. And uh, as, as Ruby reminded me today, she was on that uh, pulpit search committee and uh, 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 John was on that pulpit search committee as a part of the board uh, back in those days. And, and that, was a, that was a wonderful, wonderful time together. So it was, uh, it was all great stuff. Hey, I'll tell you just really quickly, um, some of the, I'll say the rest of the story, because uh, some of you may not have heard this, because uh, it, it's just you know, too much stuff to share from the pulpit. But uh, and after, after really enjoying a wonderful Christmas season, uh, Sunday services, uh, Christmas Eve service that I love, uh, it's my favorite service of the year, uh, New Year's Eve service, uh, baptized 21 people as a part of that service, all of that's great, and uh, we come, Rhonda and I, we're driving onto the parking lot on Sunday, January 2nd, the first Sunday of the year, and we happen to have a combined service that day, and I remember driving on the parking lot, and it hit me like a wave. Uh, as we're driving literally right into the parking lot that our time was coming to a close. And I'm here like, I told Rhonda, I, I just, she was sitting next to me and, and I, I told her, I said, I, I can't explain it, but this is, it's hitting me. And I said, in addition to that, what also is hitting me is if Pastor Rich Garrett is to call me, I'm supposed to entertain the call, whatever that means. We sat in the parking lot for a couple of minutes. We talked about it, but it's a Sunday, right? So you can't just sit in the parking lot and talk about it. You got to, you know, game on, time to do church, right? So, so we, we just kind of set that aside and, and all of that. The next day, I'm conducting an interview with a couple that I'll leave unnamed at this point <clears throat> for, I'll say, this position to be the pastoral care and seniors pastor, living proof pastor of our church. I'm conducting that on Monday night the 3rd, and we're having a, a wonderful meal together at Texas Roadhouse. I still have not had a good, a bad meal at Texas Roadhouse. So that's, um, and we get to the end of the interview, and, and, and the couple, and rightly so, says, you know, so how long do you think you'll be there? And I said, I, I'm here until God moves us on. You know, I just... It's the typical answer I give, and I said, we've been here 15 years, God moves us on, but we, we need to follow the Lord's will. And, and they asked the specific question of, well, what happens if Pastor Rich Garrett calls you and asks you to go to the district office? <laughs> and I said, well, I'll, I'll deal with that if or when that happens. Kind of like, that's kind of a random oddball question. And yeah. so, you know, and, and we had a great interview and talked together for a while. And, and anyway, the next morning, the 4th, which was a Tuesday, I get a text from Pastor Rich. Now, he texts me about a lot of different things. And so to get a text from him is not unusual. I serve the executive presbytery for you know, our network. And, and, and so he'll, he'll call me about different stuff at different times. So I didn't really think much about it. And, and, and he said, he called me when he get a chance today. So I said, great. So I called him. And 45 minutes later, he is unpacking this thing of what he would like to do and inviting me to come into the district office. And I'm here like, wow. So literally, it was out of the blue. Um, did, not, did not anticipate that happening, though some of you have been very kind in saying, well, we saw this coming, you know, kind of deal. Uh, some of you said that. Um, I... Uh, I, I'm, I wasn't, I'm not, I'm not looking to try to move or, or leave or, or any of that. But I will say that when, when you sense that God's wanting you to do something, you need to follow what God wants. Amen. And, and that's, that's what this is. And so, uh, 
that's why it was so tough this weekend to resign. Because uh, I love you guys, you know, and we, thank you, appreciate that. We love being here. So anyway, um, all of this had to have approval of the Executive Presbytery on uh, the 31st of the month, which was Monday. I actually sit on that Presbytery, and, and so I had to kind of leave, and then they talked about it, and they said some extremely nice things about me and about what this is all about, and I'm mean, like, you're very kind, like way too kind. Um, and then, then we start walking down the road. So some of you asked, uh, will we be moving? Uh, yes, at some point in time we need to. I, I don't look forward to commuting to uh, Irvine um, every day of the week. <laughs> um, no. So, um, on a, you know, a good day, I can make it from my house to the district office in an hour and ten minutes. But on a bad day, it could be, I don't know, two and a half hours anyway. And so, um, yeah. Uh, thanks for praying for us. I'm praying for you. We're, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, we don't invest 15 plus years without wanting this thing to be handed off as best we possibly can. And so uh, thanks for praying for the board. Thanks for praying for the pastoral team. We had a great pastoral staff meeting this morning and talking about all sorts of things as we're moving forward. So God's good. He's got it in the palm of his hand. Doesn't catch him by surprise. He's not having go, ooh, I didn't see that one coming. Right? That's not, that's not what's going on. God knows it all. And he doesn't steal from one without supplying for the other. I believe that with all my heart. And so, uh, so we walked from there, okay? That may raise some questions. And so I thought, you know, let's take a moment while you're finishing up your chocolate cake. Uh, though I will say, I've talked long enough because most of you are done with your chocolate cake, so I, that's a great thing. <laughs> are, do you have any questions, any, anything that you would like to raise in the way of a question? Because there could be some of you kind of going, hey, what, what about this? Yeah, Frank, go ahead. Does all the existing staff have to resign? So, great question. Does all of the existing staff have to resign? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question both ways, uh, yes and no. Okay, so, so protocol in the Assemblies of God is that the current pastoral team is there at the desire of the lead pastor. So I told our, our pastoral team, I said, before I go, I need everybody's resignation on my desk. Okay? Now, um, that, that's protocol, because what happens is that when a new pastor comes in, the new pastor shouldn't have to let someone go. They can just receive somebody's resignation. Okay. Rather than putting the new pastor, you don't want to put the new pastor in the awkward situation. Now, having said that, um, our team's functioning really well. There's there's nothing, you know, that's that's bad or wrong or, or you know, there's no issues. I'm just, I'm just shooting as straight with you as possible. So um, uh, we would hope that uh, as many of our as our pastoral team will continue to be here for many many years to come. So I know it just sounded like I just talked out of both sides of my mouth with that. But hopefully you hopefully understand that, again, in the Assemblies of God, because pastoral staff members are there at the desire of who the lead pastor would be, a new lead pastor could come in and want to do something a little bit different. Uh, but because, once again, things are going well, uh, I don't sense that there would be that desire to make those changes. Okay, makes sense? Does that also include all the campuses? Yeah, so thank you for that. Great questions, friends. Firing the good questions here today. Uh, so the campuses we would handle differently uh, because they are, um, though they also are technically staff pastors of ours since we are the parent church, uh, they are leading their individual congregations. And, um, and, you know, with Pastor Josh stepping into the role that he's stepping into, um, the goal, the wish, the desire is to keep things as seamless as possible. And so uh, that would be, not be the anticipation there. Okay? Good, good, good two very good questions. Way to go. Other questions? <clears throat> Cool. Okay.
Okay, so I, I just wanted to give you a chance to ask. So there we go. Okay, excellent. Um, we'll be friends. I am your friend. I'll stay your friend. You know, I'll be your friend on Facebook. I'll be, you know, just whatever, right? So it's just that there's going to be a little more distance. That's all. Because of my role as assistant superintendent, um, uh, I will be uh, visible. You know, I, we're, I'm going to be traveling the, the network, and there will be events that will happen. If they get hosted here, you'll see me uh, at certain things. So uh, that's just normally what happens. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I, number one, I think you need to take that up with God. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it's just, there, there was one person, I think it was at the 11 o'clock service, that called out pretty loudly, don't go. <laughs> That's very nice. So thank you. That's very nice. Yes. Yes, sir. Are you going to come back and play golf with us? Yes. Are, are you going to invite me back, man? There we go. There we go. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I'm not planning to do that. So. It's all good. Excellent. Anything else you got? Okay, let me share a couple of other things with you. Uh, we do have our ministry conference coming up at the end of this month on a Saturday. And so I, I really want to encourage you to come out, even if you can't be there for the whole thing. It starts at 9. We're going to serve a continental breakfast prior to the start of that conference at 9 a.m. And it'll be in the sanctuary. We're getting all of our campuses to join in on this. Various leaders, workers, teachers, different ones that are coming. And uh, it'll be a great time uh, that we have uh, together that day. It'll go from 9 until 3. There is a free lunch. How many people like free lunch, right? So free lunch that's involved there. That'll be served about the noontime hour. There'll be some keynote speakers as well as some breakout sessions. And you'll be seeing some more things as we move to this weekend, okay? Uh, also... We want to be praying for some various needs here today. We want to pray for uh, Perry Schuyler uh, for healing. We want to pray for Maria and Marion and Augie. And uh, I just, um, I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I, uh, many of you know uh, Greg Thompson, uh, and uh, some of you, some of you don't, but some of you do. Uh, Greg, very faithful on Wednesday night. Uh, and in fact, I can, I can stand in front and I can look exactly where he would sit. Every, you guys are creatures of heaven, I must admit. <laughs> you tend to like to sit in the same places. And, and uh, Greg went in because uh, he needed a procedure done on his foot. And uh, he is no longer with us. Oh, yeah. Where did he and, sit, Greg Thompson? Um, on, on Wednesday nights? Yeah, not, not in this room. So Wednesday night, it was in the fellowship hall just off to my left. Yeah. And I, I just, it makes me sad. And, and there's a, some other emotions, honestly, going through my mind uh, where um, someone goes in for a procedure and uh, like three, four days later, they're not with us. So um, I want us to uh, be praying for, he has some family, um, uh, not many family members, but he has some family, we pray for them uh, today as well. How many of you, by an upraised hand, have a, a need in your heart today? Something that you would like God to take care of, okay? So in the midst of this, God is able, friends, God is able. And so we continue to pray for one another. I think that's the reminder out of all of this for me today is how important prayer is. How important prayer is, because God is able to handle things. He can take care of the impossible. Uh, that which is impossible with man is possible with God, right? And so we just need to continue to intercede. Yes, ma'am. I need a lot of prayer. Um, I'm having surgery on my right elbow the 11th of March, in case any of you. It's going to be at Loma Linda, and it'll be the same doctor that did my other arm. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. So yeah. I, just, I just need a lot of prayer because Absolutely. I'm really concerned about it. But I know he'll do a good job. Yeah. Because yeah. he did an awesome job on this one. And, and we'll pray to that end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's pray together, okay? Father, today in the name of Jesus, we take this moment. And we thank you, Lord, that 
as we lift up these requests that are upon our hearts, we pray that you would powerfully, powerfully move within lives. Some of them are written down on this sheet that we receive each and every week. And so we, we list the names. We list Perry in front of you, and, and we bring Maria and Marion and Augie in front of you, Lord. We pray your touch upon their lives. Each one of them, Lord, they need healing from you. We thank you that you are our healer. And I pray that you would touch them in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that as we've lifted up hands across this room, that, that some are needing healing in this place as well. And I pray that you would be their strength, that you would be Jehovah Rophe, that you would be their healer. And Lord, whether it is surgery that people are facing, whether it's uh, aches and pains, whether it's diabetes, whether it is uh, cardio problems or cancer issues or whatever it be, we thank you that you are able to handle it. So we place it in your hands. We ask, Lord, that you would powerfully move even beyond healing issues. Uh, Lord, for miracles that you take place in lives, I pray that you would be the miracle worker. I also pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would be Jehovah Jireh, that you would be our provider. Thank you, Lord, for bringing that provision into people's lives today. So we place it in your hands. We bless your name for all of what you are doing. You are amazing. You are awesome. We give it all to you in Jesus, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Well, I hope, I trust that you have that white sheet in front of you today. And uh, as uh, you have that in front of you, let's welcome uh, John L. Martin as he comes and shares with us today. Let's do it. Well, bless the Lord. You know the story about the plane that was going down and somebody said, Somebody that's a preacher, do something religious. And the preacher got up and went up to the front took an offering. <laughs> Larry, come on up. Manny, you got a bag? Yeah. Yes. Well, okay. Manny's getting started on it. Ooh, hallelujah. Just, no, just wait a minute. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on the offering, both gift and giver, for the kingdom of God in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 God bless you, gentlemen, as you do that for us today. Today is our third in a series of five diamonds for daily living. Our first one was passing through valleys of weeping, Psalm 84, a couple of weeks ago. Last week we looked at Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd. Today we are looking at Isaiah chapter 50. We're looking at specifically at the names of the Lord as it is encouraged. The encouragement there for us is to... Stay upon the name of our God. Next week, we'll be looking at the disciples' prayer, as we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer, from Matthew chapter 6. Our last uh, message in these, this series of five is from Ezekiel 44, as we learn about the priests of the Lord, and specifically the one priest that we all can be for our Lord. We look forward to seeing each one of you uh, in the next couple of weeks as we finish off this series on diamonds for daily living. Isaiah chapter 50 verses 10 and 11 is our text. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire, and the sparks that you have kindled, this you shall have of mine hand, you shall lie down in sorrow. I have one theme in everything that I share, whether it's prophecy, book of Romans, or any other study. That is, God is not a man to lie, neither is he the son of man to repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do, or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? In biblical prophecy teachings, I want to show that what he has said will happen, and things that he said would happen, have happened. Therefore, we can know that the prophecies of the Lord are sure. 27% of your Bible, one out of every four scriptures, is prophetic. 
It, in this lesson on the resurrection, I want you to know the scriptures that foretold his death. There are approximately 330 Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and two-thirds of them are yet to be fulfilled. A dozen or more points can be made in various types of, of lessons, but they all come back to the fact that God is faithful to his word. Don't give up on the Lord. It's a lesson for all of us that he comes, he will bring healing, he will bring provision, he will bring peace and security. I want to show how God has done this for others and, and remind you he will do it for you. C.S. Lewis once said, I believe in Christianity like I believe in the rising sun, not because I can look up in the sky and see it, but because by it, I can see everything else. There is no clearer vision that we have than the help of the Holy Spirit to see through things that are happening in our world today. God told Moses, go in and take the promised land from Numbers 33. He told Joshua in chapter 1, verse 6, go in and take and possess the land. Under Moses, the people tested God ten times. They wanted God to change their circumstances before they would believe him. And God wanted them to believe him and claim the promises and go in and take the land. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, Moses says, You shall remember all the way the Lord thy God has led thee these forty years to test you, to humble you, to prove you and your character, and see if you would obey his word or not. Instead, the Israelites turned their problems around and tested God and asked him to change their circumstances before they would believe him. In Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4, we find that the people came up to the borderline of going into the promised land, Kadesh Barnea, and there they stopped and refused to go in until God changed the circumstances. And the Lord says to them in chapter 3, verse 11, They shall not enter in to my rest. That's a message to all of us to this very day. What is the rest of God? How can we rest in Him? And it, I tell you that it is this one thing, obtaining a promise of God. God has given you and I promises. When circumstances deny God's promises, what are you going to do? Do you believe God and go and grab your promise and hang on to it? Or do you ask God to change your problems? Beloved, this is the bedrock foundation of intercessory prayer. You have a need and you go in and claim the need, that scripture that fits your need in the name of Jesus. You believe God to change the mess you find yourself in. This is what we have found here in these words from Isaiah. The person who trusts in the Lord is walking in darkness. And the instruction we have is trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon your God. Believe him and he will change the circumstances. Are we going to trust God in the time of darkness or are we going to try him? The word that God used in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that I read to you where he said, I took them into the wilderness to test them. The Hebrew word and translating later the Greek word is the word that is used for a metallurgist. He is the guy who takes some acid or some other type of testing liquid or action and he puts it on metal to find out what it's made of. Is this real gold or is it pretend? Is it fake gold? Is this really true or is it not? And what he was doing to the Israelites was testing their faith. Do you have real faith? Do you really trust him? Here is this problem. How are you going to respond to it? Well, what a difference a day makes. One phone call can change your life forever. December 10th, 
Dell and I have been married for two and a half years. Four o'clock in the morning. Ring, ring, ring. Yes. <laughs> Weeping voice said, put Della on the line. Okay. She begins to weep. And then when she gets off, dad's had a stroke. We got to get to the hospital. We get to the hospital just in time to hear the doctor say, he's got maybe two hours. Go say your goodbyes. What a day that has been to think about every December 10th it rolls around. To remember the shock. You in here have had days like that. We all face those moments. And we remember. Do we get over it? No. But how did we get through it? One day at a time. One promise at a time. One prayer at a time. We look to Him who gives us the answers, who gives us the light, who provides for us the strength and the ability to go through such times that try men's souls. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of His servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold, all ye that kindle the fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you have kindled. This shall you have of mine hand. You shall lie down in sorrows. Let me break this up with verse 10. Who is among you that fears the Lord? It's interesting in the New King James, it puts a question mark after each one of these statements. Where in the King James, it puts a question mark at the end. Do you fear the Lord? What is that word fear? Well, depending on the usage of it, it could mean you're flat out afraid. It's used of Jacob when he's thinking about Esau. He thought Esau would kill him. And so it says the word fear in the Hebrew. But it's also the same word that we are instructed by Solomon to fear God and keep his commandments. Same word, but in that case, it's the reverential awe and honor of our God. Throughout the last 50 years, I've seen Christians running from camp meeting to revival to healing services to prosperity conventions and back again. Running from one light to another light, from one mountaintop to another mountaintop, seeking the feeling of spirituality, of excitement, and thinking that that's the normal Christian life. What is the normal Christian life? Not, it can take you through darkness. Not just a tunnel. Not just a momentary submarine dive and then back up. You're walking in it. You're enduring it. This saint who trusts the Lord, who believes God, who hears the voice of God's servant, finds themselves walking in darkness. Annie Johnston Flint was bedridden for many years. She had bed sores. She was confined to a single bedroom in her house. Her loved ones literally had to take care of her like a baby. Yet she wrote some of the most beautiful psalms and poems that are ever in print. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiply trials is multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed, ere the day is half done. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundaries known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Watchman Nee, the Chinese sage, wrote many books. One of them, The Normal Christian Life, based off of the first eight chapters of the book of Romans. And he describes a normal Christian life that is completely different than when one we normally hear about. 
There's a strange, mysterious scene presented to us in early Genesis. God is walking through the Garden of Eden, and he says, on a question, Adam, where are you? And Adam was hiding from God. Isn't that bizarre? Today, we have many people saying, where's God? Where's God in suffering? Where's God in my troubles? Where's God in my, my darkness? God, where are you? This time, it seems that God is the one that's hiding. We find several biblical personalities who were asking that of God. Where are you? Jesus said that on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Psalm chapter 10, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 44 accuses God of being asleep. Arise yourself. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Isn't that an odd way of referring to God, asking for his help? Wake up. <laughs> Awake and do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our, diff our affliction and our oppression? Isaiah 45, truly you are a God who hides himself. The, the Tommy Tenney book, God the Chasers, is the idea and the concept that God is there for us to find if we will pursue him, yet it seems like he might be hiding himself. Job wondered, where was God? Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? God later turned to Job and began to ask him questions instead of answering the ones Job asked. God turns around and says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth and when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, where were you, Job? There's nothing in this passage that we are looking at today that says that you deserve the darkness you're in. Not a word of it. There's not a question about it. Don't beat yourself up over it. Now jump to verse 11, if I may. Behold all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you have kindled. Some of you are probably familiar with uh, Pastor Chuck Swindoll, wonderful man of God with a number of books that he has written, some real encouraging thoughts. I heard him not too long ago as he was talking about how we handle ourselves in the darkness that we face, the troubles, the storms of life. And he chose three words that began with the letter F. And those words were fear, fate, and failure. But as I looked at that and prepared this message and thinking about what he said, I added two more. I added fortitude and fix it. The concept first of fear, we find ourselves in a desperate situation and we, this is not in your notes, <laughs> okay, I see you looking, it's not there, you can turn it over and write this down if you like, <laughs> first word beginning with the letter F, fear, you run for cover, you try to avoid the mess. Some of you act like the world's going to come to an end every five minutes. Oh! <laughs> and, and you're afraid. All of the props have been knocked out from underneath you, you think. You know, one of the words that uh, is used of God from the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33, when the, the uh, promised land was being divided up among the children of Israel. The statement was made concerning the tribe of Asher. It said, you'll have this piece of land of the promised land that's extremely rocky. And the Lord will provide for you shoes of iron and brass so that you can handle the type of territory where you're going. And he's going to give you olive oil for your feet so that you can have your feet not get so many blisters and hurt from those shoes of iron and glass. And it says, as your day is, so will your strength be. Don't worry about 
wanting to give up at the end of the day because God's promised that your strength will get you to the end of the day. The new day is dawning. Joy comes in the morning. A new fresh zeal comes in the morning. Strength comes in the morning. Don't quit at the end of the day. One other thing he says, underneath are his everlasting arms. And that is the message here in reference to someone who feels like all of the props have been knocked out from underneath you. That phrase in the Hebrew means underneath bottomless are his everlasting hands to catch you and to carry you and not let you fail. He is there, the old song says, all the time, waiting patiently in line. Fear. Another is fatalism. Stuff happens. If you've ever been to Hawaii, they have shaka. That's hang loose, or as the youth we used to say, chill. Take a chill pill, you know. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to work out. Don't, don't, don't fuss with it. Doris Day, for some of you that are old enough to remember her, in the 50s sang a song, K Sirah Sirah. Whatever will be, will be. This, this is the attitude of, eh. You know, you go and tell somebody of all the problems, they just look at you and go, eh. Well, you want to just give them a good smack. You know, but this is the fatalistic attitude of, oh, well. That's one of the words of how to handle darkness. Another is failure. You feel like it's your fault. You messed up somewhere along the line. You sinned. This is the, the attack of Satan. You know, you deserve this. Just look at yourself. And you, you know what we're, the first thing we are to do? We agree. <laughs> well, I know I'm a mess. I sure don't need his help. But his, his name means the accuser of the brethren. It is his full-time job to make you feel like dirt. And that is the concept of being a failure. Uh, the other one is fortitude. Uh, some of you remember the story of Jim Elliott and the five missionaries that went to Central America. The movie End of the Spear was based off of this incredible event where they went in and landed and immediately were attacked and killed before they had a chance to witness to these this secluded tribe of individuals. And later, Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth Elliott, wrote about this, and she and the wives of these men went down and witnessed to the tribe and got many of them converted to Christianity. And her motto, in a, if you look her up on YouTube, you can find this rather lengthy Bible study that she does, and all through the entire time that she's talking, she comes back to one statement over and over that has been her life. Do the next thing. Whatever it is, in the midst of your mess, do the next thing. Don't sit and have a pity party. Get up and do the next thing. That's F number four. F number five is what this passage is talking about. Behold all you, verse 11, that kindle a fire, that can pass yourselves about with sparks, Walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you have kindled. Word number five, F. Fix it. This is a delicate thing, a tightrope that I want to walk. Because God has given many of you talents that you have. You've had experience of solving problems in the past. And sometimes people have come to you for counseling and have asked, how do I fix my problem? And you might get the reputation of being God's fix-it man. We can come and get an idea how to fix my mess. But in this particular case, God is telling you, don't be Mr. Fix-it. Don't be Miss Fix-it. <laughs> Della will be with us tonight when I do this message again, and I won't tell this story, and I sure hope they don't put this one on the web, but I'll tell it. You're going to tell? 
When we were young, she would come up with a problem and I would just give an answer. She said, what do you, Mr. Know-it-all, Mr. Fix-it man? <laughs> you know, and I realized she didn't want answers on how to fix the mess. She wanted to talk about the mess. I wanted to get past it and go on to the next thing. You know, <laughs> but she wanted to kind of, I thought, belabor the point. I found out that ladies like to talk. <laughs> And I was, you know, getting that puzzle fixed in my life to be quiet and listen. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> still, still learning. God is saying to us, stop. Don't pursue your own way out of your darkness. Stop and tread water. Push the matches of your talents and abilities just out of reach. We are forever rushing headlong through life on a dead run. We don't even take time to hear what God's messages are to us. Now there's times when God gives you a message and you've got to run to keep up with Him and that's what our pastor is facing now. I mean, God spoke to him on one day and then a couple days later, his whole ministry is turned in a completely different direction and God will do that. There's times when you have to run to keep up with him, but there are times when he wants you to stop and pause and tread water. God told Elijah to go to the brook and wait. While he was there, the ravens came and brought him his food. God spoke to him there. I absolutely firmly believe that if he had gone to a different river, he wouldn't have had water to drink and the ravens wouldn't have showed up and he wouldn't have heard God speaking to him, he would have missed God's message because he didn't go to the place God wanted him to go. Have you ever gone to the wrong brook and missed the ravens? I have. Have you ever sat down and said, okay, God, I've got five minutes, what's on your mind? <laughs> when we light our own matches, temporary relief, but God says, in your temporary relief, I have this for you. You will lie down in sorrow. You're going to miss the ravens and the nourishment. You're going to miss the message of deliverance. You're going to miss the growth that he had for you spiritually. Let us trust in the name of the Lord, Isaiah 50, verse 10, and stay upon our God. This brings us to a study of the names of God. In preparing this, I found one particular uh, study that just took apart all kinds of names that are available to God. And I didn't count them all, but I thought, my goodness, there's Adonai, there's Elohim, there's El Shaddai, there's all of these different names, and all of them have a purpose. The word Odonai, Lord, you find that in your capital letters every time you read the King James. It's, it's the word Adonai, not Yahweh. We have the word Elohim, which is all through the book of Genesis chapter 1, when it's talking about, and God made this, and God said, and that was made. And, and <laughs> interestingly enough, that word Elohim is plural. If it was translated correctly, and God's said, let there be light, if it was translated straight into the English like it should have been. The word El is the word singular for God, Daniel. The Lord is my judge, the Lord. El Shaddai is that name. He's the Almighty One. In Genesis chapter 17, we find that Abraham, at 99 years of age, is being told by the Lord, I am the Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will set up a covenant between you and me. All through this time of the book of Genesis, we find these words of God's name that are similar to the ones we find in the book of Job. That's why so many feel that Job was written long before the time of Moses, possibly even before the time of Noah, that Job was a man who feared God and walked humbly before him. In Exodus 
chapter 3, the Lord shows up to Moses and talks to him out of a burning bush and tells him, my name is I Am. After Moses says, well, what's your name? I Am. That's not a whole lot of help, but okay. Then in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, we find God comes to him and speaks to him and says, my name is Yahweh. It's translated Jehovah into English. Jehovah Yahweh means I am. So I ask you the question, what am you? <laughs> Are you sick? <laughs> Are you lonely? Are you in need of someone to be with you? Are you lost? Are you worried? Are you broke? God will be what you need because he says to you, I am. Jehovah Rapha, he says, I am the Lord that heals. We find this from Exodus as the children of Israel have left Egypt and they come to a spring of water and God introduces himself to them and says, I want you to know my name to you is I am the Lord that healeth thee. And I will put none of these diseases upon you that I have put on Egypt. Follow me, obey me, and I will care for you. I am your healer. Then he comes in Jeremiah chapter 23. When the people are totally and completely sinful, filled with iniquity, have lost their way, they are no longer what we would consider as saints. And they have sinned, and they are now going into captivity because of their sins. And the question is, is how do you get back to a place where God will accept you? How do I clean up my life? Because absolutely, you know, obviously the devil is telling me I'm a big bad sinner and I'm never going to be any good. How do I get to be righteous again? What good works must I do to get in God's good favor? And the answer is, you can't. And he comes to Jeremiah and he says, you can't, but I can. If you will, as Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, that we repent of our sins and call upon him and confess that he will forgive us of our sins. We find it in, in John. If we will confess our sins, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What God is telling, if we will take one step toward him, that 15 miles of distance between me and my God, he will make up the rest of it. I take one step toward him and he rushes in to me and he gives me his righteousness. This was the message that he gave to Abraham that's found in the book of Genesis. He believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. And Paul reminds the, the Christians, the, the Jews and the Gentiles that God had done this for Abraham. He will do it for you in Romans chapter 4. Believe on the Lord and he will be your righteousness. I don't have to work it up. In fact, it would be kind of silly of me to think I could. I think it was, uh, I think it was, it was Charles Spurgeon that said he would hate to go to heaven and meet the guy who was able to get to heaven based off of his own works. He said, I don't want to hear that all through eternity, how he did it, because I can't. <laughs> I don't want to listen to that guy brag about himself. Well, the message is none of us can all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and he will give us his forgiveness and righteousness.
Jehovah, our shepherd, Jehovah Rohi, we saw last week. He is our guide. He is our shepherd. He is our caregiver. He provides for us guidance. He provides for us protection. He provides for us provision. All of these things are given to us through the Lord, our shepherd. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. Genesis 22, verses 13 and 14. This message here is concerning Abraham, who called the name of the place where he was about to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, that name, Jehovah Jireh. Now, someone who would put two and two together and say, wait a minute, John, God didn't introduce himself as Jehovah until Exodus chapter 6. How come it's being used here in Genesis at this point where Abraham is referring to God as Jehovah? It's because that Moses wrote the book. He looked back on this and the message had been carried down through the decades that when Isaac asked his father, where is the sacrifice? Abraham said God will provide for himself a sacrifice. And Moses writing that chose the name Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And he carries that statement not only into the point where God did provide the sacrifice for our sins through Christ Jesus, but whatever it is that you need, God will be your provider when you call upon that name. In Philippians chapter 4, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's the name, Jehovah Jireh. You know, it isn't enough just to know these names exist. You're not going to have a test from me next week that says, do you remember all those names? Write down what they mean. <laughs> but during our walk with the Lord, there's going to be times when you're going to be confronted with a situation where this name or one of this, these names here will meet your need. So keep these names close to you. Jesus has said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. God the Father is saying the same thing to us through these seven Jehovah names that are linked together with his power. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is our peace. This is one of the most fascinating uh, passages of scripture in Judges chapter 6 verses 23 and 24. Now, I didn't mention before I got started, there is a law that is used for uh, scriptural uh, interpretation and commentary by uh, some of the leading theologians. It's called the law of first use. And that statement means in the definition of a word or a name, you look for the first time it's used in scripture and understand how it is defined there understand what it means there that's what god has intended for us to understand throughout all the centuries how that name or that word was used the very first time that's the right use of the name and that's what we have in the concept of jehovah shalom you remember the story of gideon and the 300 isn't that a fascinating thing the, the, the story starts out with him in a wine press, which is usually down in a gully, and he's threshing wheat, which is the wrong place. When you're going to knock chaff off of a wheat, you want to be someplace where it's breezy, so that when the kernel of wheat gets smacked, the chaff will float away with a nice gentle breeze, and you are left with the kernel, and then you can take that and go make your bread. And he's down in a hole where there's no breeze, trying to knock the chaff off of wheat so he can go down and make himself some bread. Now, I've been to Trader Joe's and I've gotten some of their Ezekiel bread, and I swear the chaff is still there. <laughs> well, can't they do better than this? This stuff gets, things are getting stuck in my teeth. 
you know, what are they, and they charge big money for that stuff. And uh, it's crazy. Well, I can imagine this is the kind of bread that Gideon was ending up with you know, down there. And then an angel shows up and, and, and says, Oh, mighty man of valor. Now, that is the funny. I mean, God's got a great sense of humor. This guy's down there hiding from the Midianites who are destroying their crops. And he says to him, You mighty man of valor. Yeah, right. <laughs> who are you talking to? Let me check behind me. Or you got a cue card you're reading or something, mister? And that he was anything but. And the promise comes to him that he is going to deliver the people and God's going to be with him. And with a strong, strong, mighty arm, he will bring peace to the people. And so when the angel disappears and he thinks to himself, oh, no, I've seen the face of God. Now I'm going to die. <laughs> and he's, this guy really has a lot of questions in life. And it's kind of fun to watch through that passage in chapter 6, all of the things he asks. And the voice comes back and says, no, you're not going to die. You're going to be all right. He builds an altar. He makes a sacrifice to the Lord. And he says, Jehovah is our peace. Now, can I ask you a question? What had changed? The Midianites were still out there pillaging the land, stealing their crops and their money. They still had this big battle that was in front of them. Nothing, nothing, nothing had changed except Gideon's heart. He now saw God as our peace. And with that promise, with that message, with that determination in his very being, he went forward. And God was able to use him to bring deliverance to the people because Jehovah is our peace. He is our peace. Jehovah Shammah. When we look at our last diamond for daily living, we'll be going to this chapter 48, verse 35 in Ezekiel, where the last words of the book of Ezekiel, after describing the millennial temple of God. What makes that massive, beautiful temple special is that the Lord, Shama, the Lord is there. Number seven, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. When Moses went up to the hilltop during the battle against the Amalekites, he held up the staff of God and the people were winning and when he, his arms got tired and he lowered them then Aaron his brother and her H-U-R they climbed that same mountain and they had Moses sit down on a rock <coughs> and then they held up Moses' hands so that the people would win the battle and this is where the name comes from. He is our banner. We, many uh, of us are familiar with the beautiful marine uh, statue that is in Washington that is the, taken from the photo at Iwo Jima when the four Marines are lifting up the flag of the United States. And that emboldened the American soldiers who were fighting that battle to keep going, to keep moving. And that is what God is for you and I. He is that banner. He is that flag. He is that victory. It's in Him that we fight. It is in Him that we succeed. It is in Him that we conquer. And He is our banner. He is our canopy. <clears throat> As Pastor John has mentioned his uh, leaving over these last 15 years, if I want to hear anything from him, it's, John, you held up my arms. And I would hope that all of us could hear that testimony, that we have held up his arms when he was tired. And I trust and pray that whomever God sends to us, that we will do the same for him, that his arms will be lifted up and his family will be encouraged as we stand with them to conquer the evil in this world and to bring victory to the kingdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit that is shed into our hearts. Those are the seven names of our God that we find from the Old Testament, but I want to add one more. 
The angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary and said, Thou shalt bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. Jesus is Greek. That's his Greek name. But in Hebrew, which is what he probably was called as a young lad, Joshua. Joshua is his Hebrew name. Jesus is his Greek name. Joshua is a contraction of two words. Jehovah, Ashua. The Lord, our helper. Of these seven names that I have shared with you this morning and encouraged you to think about in times of difficulty, if you look at that and you say to yourself, John, none of these names fit my need. Well, this last one does. The Lord will be your helper. He will be your helper. Beloved, you can watch this as it's videotaped on YouTube and you can bring it up and you can hear this message again and again as you wish. But one thing you can't do is you can't take me home with you. <laughs> Della wouldn't appreciate that too much. So I can't be there for you to pull out of the closet and say, John, what was that name again? What was that word again? But may I say to you, God has said, you can take him home with you. He has offered himself to you and to me to go home and be with us, to be our helper, to be our healer, to be our provider, to be our peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace in his holy name. God bless you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Pastor John. Oh, it's great to have John sharing with us, isn't it? Uh, great, great, great word. Thank you so much for walking us through the names of God and uh, a great study for us today. And I will say, John has done a phenomenal job of holding up my hands. And uh, he's been a great, great, great uh, uh, lay leader of our church uh, for many, many years. I'm so thankful for him. Well, as we leave this place, let's not leave God's presence, but let his presence go before us and uh, strengthen us every step of the way. So, Father, we pray that as we go, that your protection would be ours and that we would serve you with everything we say and do. We bless your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three easy ways to give tonight. The first is through PushPay. Simply text through your smartphone VF Assembly to 77977. The second is by going to the church website at www.vfassembly.org and click Give at the top right side of your screen. The third way you can give is to mail your giving directly to the church at 15260 Nisqually Road in Victorville, 92395. Thank you and may God bring his richest blessings upon you as you give. God bless. Amen.